Um, I was assigned the topic you see uh, behind me here from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the God of all comfort. And uh, I'm really thankful for that because this is a passage of Scripture that I've been aware of. Uh, I've uh, read it before. I've actually used it in private discussions with people. I've never in my life presented a sermon on this. I'm not sure that I've ever heard a sermon on this before. And so it kind of gave me the impetus to do a little further study on something that I hadn't uh, ever looked into that much before. But the God of all comfort, come from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 11. We're going to read uh, a number of sections as we go through our lesson for this evening. But first of all, let me just read the first three verses of this chapter, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses three, uh, 1 through 3 say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. You know, names and titles mean something, don't they? But you kind of have to hear the whole thing. If I were to say to somebody tonight, I'm the president, that might sound pretty good, but there's a big difference between being the president of the United States and being the president of my local civic club, right? Or, or the little league, uh, or, or the PTO at school or something. All of those are important positions. I'm, if you're the president of the little league or PTA or PTO, whatever they call it nowadays, uh, I'm not belittling those positions, but you got to admit, being president of the United States is, you know, a little bit more powerful, a little bit more responsibility, a little bit more difficult probably. So you want to hear the whole title. You don't want to just hear a part of it. You got to understand the whole title for it to make sense. Now the phrase, I'm saying this because God of all comfort, before we get into what that means, I want to point out something. The phrase God of something appears an awful lot in the Bible. Now, if you're taking notes, don't even try to write all these down. If you really, really want to know where they are, I'll, I'll show you later. Uh, but the first thing I would mention is this. Sometimes God is mentioned as being the God of a particular person. He's the God of Shem, the God of Abraham, the God of Elijah, the God of David, the God of Jacob, God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the God of Daniel, and even the God of hosts. Host is like a, a great crowd, a mass of people, an army, or something like that. Sometimes God is associated with a particular place. Uh, we might say a geographical location. He's the God of heaven and the God of earth, the God of Bethel, Israel, Jerusalem. Uh, he's even the God of the whole earth. Frequently in the Old Testament, God was described by one or more of his characteristics, something about his nature uh, that was especially notable. And so we have passages like this. He's the God of truth, right? The God of knowledge, the God of strength, the God of my salvation, the God of my righteousness, the God of mercy, the God of justice, the God of recompense. Uh, all of these are uh, characteristics of the nature of God. And so he is called by that name or that title. And the same thing happens in the New Testament. He's the God of glory. He's the God of patience. He's the God of hope, the God of peace, love, grace, and so on and so forth. So you see my point. Paul is falling right in line with a whole uh, list of inspired writers who refer to God by some title uh, that acknowledges who he is, what he is, and some uh, aspect of his nature. Every one of these is important. Every one of these is valuable. We can learn something from all of these, and I think that is especially true tonight of this phrase in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, that he is the God of all comfort. So how do we know what that title means? What does that suggest to us? Okay. Now, whenever we study any topic like this, and the people from Fairbanks know this about me, I'm big on Greek definitions because the Bible, we all know, was not originally written in English, right? It was written in Greek. And so uh, there's a, a wealth of information. There's a wealth of uh, definitions and scholars that can tell us what specific words mean. So that's the first thing I do whenever I want to investigate a topic. I want to find out what does that word mean in the original language. And then the second thing you can do is uh, there are books and uh, 
Stuart doesn't know what a book is. He's getting rid of all his books. He's going with all the online stuff. That's okay. I like that. I like holding books and smelling books and being surrounded by books, but it makes a lot of sense to do the online stuff. So there are um, software packages that um, can show you everywhere in the Bible where a specific word, not just a concordance, I'm talking about a specific Greek word is used. And so it may be translated a lot of different ways. And you can look and see the context of how a word is used. And that just deepens our understanding even more. And we're going to do that this evening. But then the last thing we're going to do is we're actually going to look at the context of the verse because that's what you have to put all together to come up with the, the significance or the meaning of something. So what is meant by the title, the God of all comfort? Well, first of all, the Greek word for comfort literally means a calling near or a summons. It means to call someone to your side, according to scholars. But, you know, words kind of develop along the way and they add some to their meaning. And so all the scholars go on and say that it means one of two things, basically, an exhortation or consultation. Exhortation is like to encourage or urge someone to do something. Consolation is more along the lines of uh, being comforted about something. Well, that, that kind of makes sense if you think about it. I mean, if the, if the word literally means to call someone to your side, those of you that are parents, let me ask you something. Why would you call your child to come to your side? Maybe you're out in public somewhere, you're in a store, you're at a party, you're at the church building, and you see your child and you want to call them over. What, what are you going to do? Well, maybe they've fallen and they hurt themselves and they're crying and you need to give them some comfort. Or you may need to remind them of the rules and encourage them to do the right thing. And that's the idea behind this word. It came to be used uh, in both of those ways. So now then, let's look at uh, how the word is used in Scripture. Now remember, that this is, uh, oh wait, wait. Um, I will say this. This is a noun. Don't worry, this isn't some kind of a Greek grammar lesson. I'm, I'm the wrong guy for that. That's a noun. This is the verb form of the same word. And the only reason I say that is because in our text passage tonight in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, one of those two words, either the noun or the verb, appears 10 different times in five verses. So uh, it's not just that one verse. It's not just that one phrase. But this whole concept, this whole idea is taught throughout this passage. So I'm kind of looking forward to uh, getting into those. Before we do, though... We're going to consider some other places in the New Testament where the same Greek word is found. So sometimes, same Greek word now as the God of all comfort, but it's translated exhortation. And as I mentioned before, an exhortation is like urging someone. In fact, uh, the definition is it's a strong appeal to action. Let's just read one of these as an example. Hebrews 12 and 5. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. And so what he's saying here is this part right here in quotation marks, the last part of the verse, that's an exhortation. And the writer's saying, listen, uh, sometimes things happen, you know, God's going to try to get you a message in, in something and you need to, uh, don't be discouraged now, you need to pay attention to that, you need to put that into practice and so forth. So that's an exhortation, that's urging someone to do something. So, is our text saying that he is the God of all urging? Is that what God's doing for us? He's urging us to do something? Same word is also translated encouragement. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples because it doesn't happen very often in the New Testament. Do you remember that the apostles gave Barnabas uh, his name? His real name was Joseph. That was his given name when he was born. But they called him Barnabas, which meant son of encouragement. And then when the church at Antioch received a letter from the church at Jerusalem, they were encouraged. The, the letter sent them some encouragement. So... Is he the God of all encouragement? Is that what Paul's talking about there in 2 Corinthians chapter 1? Several times, this same word appears in the New Testament and it's translated consolation. That happens four times in our text passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, the word is rendered consolation. 
Consolation is the comfort that a person receives from something or someone. Well, that, that fits, you know, it's translated comfort also there in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, so that goes right along with it. Uh, he is the God of all comfort. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 16 says that God has loved us and given us everlasting consolation, everlasting comfort and good hope by grace. So is he then the God of consolation? Is that the best interpretation? Well, grammatically speaking, as far as definitions go, it could be any one of those. But now then, if we look at the context of the passage, I think we get a a very clear picture of what it's saying. Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. There you go. That's the key to it. The word tribulation here is defined by Greek scholars as trouble involving direct suffering, persecution. Uh, this, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this particular uh, lexicon. I like this. It's Low and Nida. Uh, their lexicon is specifically designed for translators. And so a lot of times, in addition to giving you the definition, they'll tell you some ways that you have to think about whenever you're translating this into some language. So they say here, for a number of languages, trouble and suffering may be expressed as that which causes pain. Well, we know what pain is, we know what persecution is, we know what suffering is, and so the idea is that God comforts us in our pain and suffering. So now that helps us figure out how this word is used in this particular place. Uh, When we're hurting, God doesn't urge us, He comforts us. That's what we need when we're hurting. He consoles us, He gives us comfort. Now, look here, down in verse 8, Paul gives us a description of tribulation, at least what he has in mind. He uses the same Greek word that we find up here in verse 4 for tribulation, but here it's translated trouble. So look what he says. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that He will still deliver us. Now, we don't know for sure what particular episode that Paul had in mind here. He talks about some trouble that he got in uh, in Asia. Uh, I'll tell you a few things that could be in... um, The book of Acts, we read about one time when Paul was in Ephesus and the silversmiths uh, caused a big uproar. There was a big riot and so forth. And this was a very dangerous situation. In fact, when you read that, uh, Paul himself didn't even go into the big theater. There was a big theater where they uh, gathered the whole town and people were throwing dirt in the air and they were yelling and screaming and they wanted to kill somebody. And the magistrates, the government officials that knew Paul, begged him not to go in because they couldn't control the crowd. They felt sure that if Paul were to go into the theater, he would lose his life and there would be nothing they could do about it. So maybe that's what Paul's talking about. Could be. On one occasion in Asia, he was stoned and believed to be dead. Well, he said he had the death sentence in himself. That could have been it. Um, In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he mentions that he faced wild beasts in Ephesus. We don't have any record of that anywhere as far as like in the book of Acts or anything. We don't know what he's talking about. But apparently there was some occasion when, uh, you know, maybe it was kind of like the, the Christians in Rome that faced the lions and gladiators and whatever all kind of things that they had to face. But he says he actually fought wild beasts when he was in Ephesus. All of those episodes, all of those events were dangerous and difficult and painful. That's tribulation. That's the kind of thing that Paul's talking about when he says God comforts us in all of our tribulation. You and I are exposed to pain and suffering from time to time. We all have had occasion, I believe, to face some tribulation. 
And there are several reasons for that. For one thing, we live in the world and the world is cursed by sin. And you know, the Bible talks about that, how that sin and uh, uh, sickness and death and suffering uh, came into the world as the result of sin. That's just the nature of things. That's just the way it is. Besides that though, we know that Satan has tremendous influence in this world. You can look around and see it. Well, Satan is our adversary. The Bible says that. He's going around like a lion looking for somebody to eat up. Uh, Satan is our enemy. He's a deceiver. And so probably there are things that come on us from time to time, some, some difficulty, pain, suffering, persecution that's caused by Satan. Now, we don't like to talk about this next one, but I'll tell you where a lot of our pain and suffering comes from is, uh, he's up here. Where a lot of our pain and suffering comes from is foolish decisions that we make, right? Do, do we ever do something that's not very smart and it winds up coming back to hurt us. You know, Peter talked about that. He said, some people are reproached for the name of Christ. Some people suffer as Christians, but you know, some people just suffer because they do the wrong thing. They, they get themselves in trouble. They do stuff that winds up. I mean, if, if a guy goes out and commits a crime and then he gets put in prison, well, he's suffering, right? He's incarcerated. But he brought that upon himself. And so oftentimes in life, we do that. Well, there are a lot of different reasons, I think, and maybe various ways in which we suffer in this life. But regardless of the cause, whether it's something that somebody else does to us unintentionally, whether it's something that somebody else does to us on purpose because they want to hurt us, whether it's something that we bring on ourselves because of a foolish decision that we made, whether it's something that God allows to happen to us to make us stronger, whether it's something that Satan brings on us to try to divert our attention, whatever it is, whatever the cause of the suffering, let me ask you a question. When you're suffering, what do you need? Well, you need some comfort. And that's what God offers to us. We need some relief. Nobody wants to suffer. Honestly, we will go a long ways out of our way to keep from suffering. We'll, we'll spend a lot of money. We'll do a lot of things to avoid suffering. And whenever it happens, we try to make it stop, right? I mean, if you have a pain or a problem or something, you want to fix that so that you won't keep suffering. But there are some things we just can't fix. There are some things that are beyond our control. There are some things that we can't do anything about. So here's the question. This, this is the big part of the lesson tonight. How do we respond to that? The fact that all of us have to deal with suffering in this life. How do we respond to that? Do we get angry? Do we become bitter? Do we get mad at God? Do we get mad at the world? Do we give up? Or do we try to draw closer to God? You know, I've seen people do both. I've seen people who resent God and they leave Him because of trouble in their life. And I've seen other people who draw closer to God because of the trouble in their life. What do we do? Do we trust Him more? Do we endure the pain patiently? I think that's what Paul is addressing here in this place. And, and Paul, of all people, should know. We, we talk about the suffering that we endure, and some of us have experienced terrible pain in this life, but I think I can honestly say probably nobody here this afternoon has ever come close to the things that the Apostle Paul had to endure. Besides being led by the Holy Spirit and what he said, he had some personal experience along these lines, right? So in chapter 4, he's going to say, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed, we're perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Then in chapter six, he talks about tribulations and distresses. He talks about the times that he was beaten and put in prison and all the various things that he had to suffer. And then in chapter 11, there's that very famous passage. You know, we've all read and heard this before where Paul talks about all the terrible things that he had had to endure. All the persecution, all the pain, all the suffering. 
He was beaten, he was stoned, he endured shipwreck, faced all kinds of dangers and discomforts. Uh, in many cases from people that were his own countrymen, people that were maybe members of his family, people that were supposed to be his friends. Paul knew what it meant to suffer, probably a lot more than any of us. And yet, he says in verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about what the word blessed or blessed means. It means uh, praised, adored, or worthy of commendation. So this God that Paul is talking about, he says he's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. Whenever we know who he is and what he does, we will desire to worship him and serve him and please him. We'll acknowledge that, as Paul writes, he's the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Think about that. There's a connection here. Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Worship Him. Praise Him. He's the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. I think there's a connection between the two of those things as well, don't you? The fact that He's the Father of mercies is what makes Him qualified to be the God of all comfort. What is mercy? Mercy is defined as heartfelt compassion or pity. Because God loves us so much, He takes pity on us. He's affected by our pain and by our suffering. And so He wants to comfort us. He wants to give us some relief. He wants to help us when we're going through those difficult times. It's God's love for us that makes him want to do that. The Old Testament refers a number of times to the mercies of God. Remember, that's the, the pity, that's the compassion, that's the love that one person would have for another. And so the Bible says that God's mercies are great. His abundant mercies, his tender mercies. Remember this passage from Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22? Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. God loves us and he pities us whenever we're hurting. He feels our pain in a way that makes him want to alleviate that and give us some relief. Being the father of mercies lets us know that God has the power to do that. He, he's an inexhaustible source. He's the fountain of all compassion and mercy. He's got plenty of them. We read a while ago the passage about his, his compassions fail not. They're never going to run out. Never going to dry up. And because of that, He's the God of all comfort. Look at this. He comforts us in all our tribulation. I want to really highlight and focus on the word all. You know, when you think about that, when you really understand what God wants to do and what God can do, that He's got abundant mercy, that His compassions do not fail, that He loves you so much He wants to help you through your times of difficulty, that makes us want to worship Him and praise Him and thank Him. What, what do you do when you're hurting? Everybody here has had some situations like that, some worse than others, but um, I'll make a confession here and I'm going to assume that I may not be the only one that does this, but uh, I have a tendency to take comfort in food. We even talk about comfort food, right? There's just some things and, you know, if it's ice cream or Oreos or peanut butter or whatever it is, there are some things when things are just going bad, you just want to get a jar of peanut butter and sit down with a tablespoon and go to town. Give you some comfort. Sometimes we uh, find comfort from our friends, right? We, we like to talk to somebody about things. We like to kind of get it out of our system. Maybe you're one of those people that 
like to get away from everything. Maybe look up at the stars, you know, or uh, a, a river going by, and somehow that kind of gives you a, a feeling of peace or comfort. But see, here's the problem with that. Number one, those things aren't always available. I'm getting really low on peanut butter at home, so I hope nothing bad happens to me. Sometimes friends don't know what to say. Sometimes friends are busy. They're gone. They're out of town. They're not around for you to talk to. Sometimes the pain is so deep and so sharp and so hard that just looking at some beautiful thing in nature isn't enough to fix that. So it's an awesome thing to know that God comforts us in all our tribulations. There's never a pain, there's never a tribulation that's too big or too hard. He's never too busy. He never runs out of stuff. I'm sorry, I, I've been spending my time trying to help this person over here. I don't have enough left for you. That never happens with God. And so Paul said he's worthy of our adoration. He can do it. He wants to do it. He will do it. By the way, did you notice in our text passage here that the Bible doesn't say God will take away our pain. He didn't say that. He didn't say you'll never have to suffer. There won't be any tribulation. Um, the Bible tells us just the opposite of that, in fact. And there's a number of passages I'll refer to uh, rather quickly here. But 2 Timothy 3 and 12 says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. James said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. John said, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Peter said, don't think that the fiery trials that come upon you are something strange, like it only happens to you and nobody else. And so over and over and over, the Bible tells us you're going to be persecuted, you're going to suffer, there's going to be pain and tribulation and problems in this present world. In fact, remember this, oh, this is a lovely passage. We, we love to read this and think about it. Revelation chapter 21, right, verse 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. One of these days, God's going to just wipe all that stuff out. And we look forward to that. But listen, the fact that then we'll look back on these and call them the former things, you know what they are right now? They're the present things. Those things haven't been wiped out yet, and so there is still suffering and sickness and death and tribulation and pain and sorrow here in this life. That kind of stuff happens. In heaven, it'll be a thing of the past, but right now it's a thing of the present. And God never says, I'm going to take all that away. You'll never hurt. You'll never have any sorrow. What he says is, I will comfort you in all of that. God comforts us in all of our tribulation. Now then, I want to ask a question here and focus on this for the rest of our time tonight. Why does God do that? Now I already mentioned the fact that God loves us and He has compassion on us and He doesn't want us to hurt and so uh, that's one reason that God would do that. But I think there's a couple of things here in the text that we need to pay attention to and see what it has to say. In verse 4, he says, God comforts us that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. You know who can help you through a difficult time? Somebody that's been through the same thing. Earlier today, there was, a, I don't know if it was the news or what, Kathy had the TV on and I walked through and I, I just saw this story about a woman. She was a, a naval officer and she was injured terribly some big piece of equipment fell on her and fractured her spine and her hip and everything and and uh she was very depressed about that but there was some guy she got teary-eyed talking about it that helped her through that and helped her to do the physical therapy and everything so you know what she did she retired from the navy and she went to work for a place that uh helps disabled vets 
And it showed a bunch of them, you know, and maybe they're missing legs or arms or something, but they're working that on these machines. And she said, and I took note of it because I thought that'll be a good illustration for my little sermon tonight. She said, it's so much better when somebody's there that's been through it before. And you know that's true. You know there's something powerful about somebody coming to you when you're going through a difficult time in life and they put their arm around you and they say, I know what you're going through. I've been there. That happened to me. And I want to tell you what helped me get through it. And maybe they tell you some little exercise or some scripture or something that helped them. That means something when somebody has experienced it and now they can share it with you and they can give you comfort. And that's one of the reasons, according to Paul, that God allows us to suffer in this life so we can know what it feels like, so we can learn how to deal with it, so we can help other people that are going through the same thing. You know, we see this, I think, an illustration of it in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. The Bible says, therefore, in all things, talking about Jesus, he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. When bad stuff happens to you, and you have to get through it, then you go find somebody else that's going through that and see if you can help them through the same thing. Christians are supposed to love their neighbors as themselves. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens, the Bible says. So use that pain in a positive way. Help someone else with it. Look at verse 6. Paul says, now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Paul says, I understand. Been there, done that. Same thing happened to me. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. He says, whether I'm afflicted, whether I'm hurting, or whether I'm being comforted still, it's all about trying to apply that and help that uh, help someone else. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. Sounds to me like one of the reasons that we suffer sometimes is so that we can learn how to help others. We can sympathize with others. We can be compassionate just like God is, just like Jesus is. But there's another reason that we suffer in this life and that we depend upon the comfort of God to help us get through that. Paul talks about this here in verse 9. Now, we read a while ago uh, the, the passages just before this where Paul talked about the terrible things that he endured in Asia, the suffering he endured, the, the danger that he was faced with. And look at what he says now here beginning in verse 9. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. I think the second reason that we have to suffer in this life, that we have to experience pain that we can't fix. Oh, there are some things we would do anything in the world to fix if we could, we just can't. They're beyond our control. We suffer those things so that we can learn to depend on God, not ourselves. That's what he says. So we learn to trust in God, not in ourselves. We value independence, right? I mean, if you're a, a supervisor or a manager, you want employees that are self-starters, right? You want people that don't have to have constant hand-holding and things like that. Teachers try to uh, get their students to be more self-reliant, you know. Uh, I remember when I was in elementary school and we would ask the teacher, how do you spell a word? And she would say, go look it up in the dictionary. I thought that's the dumbest thing anybody ever said. If I knew how to spell it, you know, to look it up. But anyway, the, the point is you need to learn how to get the information on your own, right? And so teachers a lot of times will do this. They don't want to just tell students the answer. They help them to find the answer because that will help them uh, throughout life. I see all the teachers nodding, so I said the right thing. 
parents want their kids. We, we, we love our kids. We want them at home. But at the same time, we kind of want to teach them a little bit of independence. You don't want them to be crippled by their dependence upon us. We value independence. But let me tell you something. There's a time when independence is a bad thing. You don't want to trust yourself and not God. We try to be tough. We try to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We try to fix all of our own problems. And to an extent, that's pretty good. But we have to learn to trust God and depend on Him because there are some things we just can't do by ourselves. And notice this too. This is so beautiful. Paul doesn't just say trust in God. He says trust in God who raises the dead. What's the most impossible thing you can imagine? What is the most difficult thing for anybody to do? There's a lot of smart people. Men have invented all kind of things. Think about, Caleb was talking the other day. He flew to Georgia. And uh, the night before he left, he said, I can't, you know, I can't believe tomorrow night at this time I will be in Georgia. It takes like two hours to fly there. You know, and you sit in a comfortable seat and boom. Well, sometimes it's comfortable. The medical technology, the intelligence that some people have, all the things that people can do. But there's no one except God that can raise the dead back to life. So that shows us just how powerful He is. That's why we can count on Him and trust Him more than anybody else. And wouldn't this have special significance to Paul? Because you remember, he just said, we have the sentence of death in ourselves. Paul was stoned. I believe he was actually stoned to death. You may or may not believe that, but they left him for dead. They thought he was dead. And then he was raised back up. There were times that really, really bad, dangerous things happened to Paul. I mentioned the riot in Ephesus a while ago, and the magistrates even told him, we can't control the crowd. If you go in there, they're going to kill you. What a great thing for Paul to say, you know what, that's okay, because my God can raise the dead. I don't have to worry, I don't have to depend on magistrates to save my life. I don't have to depend on doctors to save my life. I'm obeying God, and if somebody kills me and he doesn't want me dead, he'll raise me right back up. And if he wants me dead, then that's where I want to be too, you know. You can trust God because he can do something as amazing as raising the dead. You know, that should have some significance to us too. And I'll tell you why. From my own personal experience, and some of you will be able to say you've had the same experience, of all the pain and suffering that I've endured here in this life, there's nothing worse than watching a loved one die. We pray for people to get well. We trust God. We ask Him to heal people. We pray for people that travel, that they'll have safe journeys, but sometimes they don't. And here's the thing. One of these days, if the world lasts long enough, every single person in this building tonight is going to die. Now, you may be healed from some disease. You may avoid some accident along the way, but ultimately, someday, sometime, we're all going to die. What a great thing to know that we serve a God that's going to raise the dead. Right? That's why he comforts us so much. You know, the Bible tells us it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. I want you to think about what David says here. I'm going to read a few verses and talk about this a little bit. Psalm 39, beginning in verse 4, he says, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly, every man at his best state is but vapor. Selah. Um, the word selah, you probably already know this, it was a musical term. You know, the, the psalms were poems, songs. It's kind of like in music, our rest. The idea when you see selah, the composer of the music was saying, stop and think about what you just sang or think about what you just heard. This is important. Give it a minute to sink in. That's, that's what Selah means, okay? 
So David says, Lord, help me to realize that the, the end is not that far away. I'm just a human being. It doesn't take much to make a human being sick or to kill them. Our life isn't that long. Now, we've known people that live to be over 100 years old, haven't we? But you know, in the grand scheme of things, when you think about eternity, 100 years isn't very long. And that's why David says, in man's best state, the strongest, the fittest, the people that go to the health food stores and go to the gyms and work out and they take good care of themselves and they're in the, the tip-top peak of physical condition, even in their best state, their life is just, whoosh, it's a vapor. You see, the, I don't have to describe the imagery there. A vapor just, it just doesn't last. I mean, it just, it's just there for a couple of seconds and it's gone. And when you think about eternity, that's the way the life of every human being is. What difference does it make if a life is one and three quarter seconds long or two and an eighth seconds long? It's nothing. And in view of eternity, our physical presence on this earth is kind of like that. I guess I need to go on. Uh, where do I go? Verse 6, surely every man walks about like a shadow. Same thing, shadow. There's nothing really there. It's an image. You can see it, but there's nothing really there. And all you have to do is turn the light on and it disappears. So that's the way our life is like. That's the way our earthly existence is. But look at what he says in verse 7. Now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. What do you hope for? What are you waiting for? As David says, our hope is in the Lord. Life is short for everybody. You know, from, from the time that we're born, uh, it's appointed for us to die. We read that passage a while ago in, in Hebrews. It's appointed for people to die. You're going to die. So am I. From the time a person is born, they're just moving towards death. You know, that could be Sad, scary, depressing. Have you ever heard the term nihilist? You know what a nihilist is? That's a person who believes that life is meaningless and rejects all religious and moral principles. Nihilists are people that just say, well, you know what? We're going to die and it's all going to be over. What's the point? Who cares? I'll tell you what the point is. The point is that when we die, it's not all over. We have hope and our hope, the Bible says, is in God. Being faced with the certainty of death doesn't have to be scary or sad or depressing. There's hope, and it's in God. Psalm 31, 24 says, Be of good courage, and He shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Okay, I've got one more little thing I want to say here at the end. How does God comfort us? Now, God is the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our tribulation. He has an inexhaustible supply of mercy and compassion. But what does He do? How, how does He fix things? How, how does He comfort us? Well, I'm going to give you some examples quickly from Scripture. Here's a couple of passages where somebody was comforted because they heard good news. All right? Uh, for example, uh, Paul was really concerned. When he went to Thessalonica the first time, he was run out of town after he was only there for a couple, three weeks. He had uh, converted some people. He established a congregation, but he had to leave, and it worried him. He was consumed by this. In fact, uh, he says, well, we thought we couldn't even endure it anymore. It was just driving him crazy. So he sent somebody to check on him and find out how they were doing. And later... When the messenger comes back and says, you know what? They're strong. They're faithful. They love you, Paul. They want to see you again. And he goes, oh, whew. he heard some good news. And we've all had cases like that. Maybe it's a financial thing. Maybe it's a health thing. We're concerned about something, but then something happens and we have good news and we're comforted by that. You know, something else that comforts us is the scriptures. The Bible actually says that. It talks about the comfort of the scriptures. And Paul, in writing to the Thessalonians, told them to comfort one another with these words. You know, there are Bible passages that are very appropriate when we're going through difficult times, sadness, persecution, suffering. 
Here's another one. You remember Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the comforter when he was talking to the apostles the night before the crucifixion. And then here in Acts chapter 9, it says that the churches were at peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what all that means, but I know that there is comfort to be had. And even though we don't know all the different methods and means that God uses to comfort us, we know it's true because he says it's true. He's the God of all comfort. I want you to think about a word that we use all the time and think about what it means. Uncomfortable. That's tied to comfort, isn't it? And sometimes in this life, we may feel uncomfortable. We have a problem and we prayed about it and God didn't fix it yet. And so we're uncomfortable. We're not happy. We don't like the way that things are going. We may wonder sometimes, why hasn't God fixed this? Why didn't God heal this person? Why didn't God give me that job that I wanted? Why didn't God help me with this relationship that I wanted to have? Ah, this is where trust comes in. We don't know. We may never know why certain things happen and why God does not intervene or do what we want Him to do. But we trust Him because He loves us. He's got the power. He can raise the dead. He's the God of all comfort. And so when we understand that, we know that He's worthy to be praised. That is the correct response to suffering. Oh, it's hard. Listen, I know what I'm saying is uh, nearly impossible, but when we suffer, the correct response is to praise God because He has all the power. He loves us. He's going to make everything right. 